Hello, welcome along to The Week That Really Was with John McGurk and Sarah Ryan. It is the 23rd of March, a very short time now to go before Easter. And this was an eventful week in Ireland because it was the week in which the Taoiseach, in response to a question from my friend and colleague Ben Scallon, announced that there should be a change in the national policy with regard to the accommodation of transgender prisoners in women's prisons. The background to this issue, for those of you who don't know, is that there are two uh, people in Limerick Prison, uh, both of them convicted sex offenders. One is a convicted uh, sex offender, the other one is convicted of making sexual threats against women, who are biologically intact, physically intact, biological men um, who, who have self-declared as women. This has been a subject of some controversy for a number of years. We asked the Taoiseach about it, and he decided to change his mind. More on that in a moment. But it was also the week, I want to talk about this, when Judge Martin Nolan decided that the value of a human eye in the case of Alana Queen Idris, who was attacked uh, a couple of years ago in a vicious assault and lost her eye, is four and a half years. That's the sentence that was handed out today in the courts of criminal justice. We'll have a slight disagreement about that. And finally, it was the week in which the government won a battle to extend, sorry, to, to not extend the eviction ban. Were they right to win it? Were they wrong to lose it? We'll give you our opinions on that. Sarah, how are you? I'm good. I was very happy to have been right in my prediction about the rugby. Very exciting day. Yeah, it was a tremendous game. Now, I thought, I have to say, that the sending off was very harsh. Yeah, uh, I did too. And I thought it ruined the game and ruined the spectacle because I thought the way it was set up, obviously we're all partisan Irish fans who wanted Ireland to win, but it kind of took the... It was touch and go until that point, I thought, and then the sending off, very soft, uh, I thought was harsh on England and kind of took away any real suspense from the game. Um, so it was kind of a bit of, for me, I'm sure other people didn't care about this, but for me as a casual watcher watching it, it kind of took the excitement out of the game and I thought that was unfortunate. I thought the first half was kind of not our best rugby. Anyway, it was kind of slow, me- messy, but um, yeah, I agree. I thought that the setting off was kind of harsh, but them's the rules, as they say. Uh, and yeah. uh, I, overall, I was very happy. What's the mood in the camp? You, of course, have inside sources there. They, are, are they sober yet or have they spent the whole week drunk? I think they're all still partying. Um, I'm a, you know, I stayed in Malahide and watched it locally with Heath and some friends, but a lot of my family were out and then um, met James afterwards and we're all out having a great time. So I'd say they'll be partying for a while. They will just uh, get get them back in training fairly quickly because they have to win the World Cup now. You know, the world number one team going into a World Cup. I mean, anything yeah. other than victory will be a disappointment, let's be honest. I know no we'll pressure. Set a, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm, just saying, I'm just saying we have to set standards fairly high. Um, so yeah, so that's it. So congratulations to the Irish rugby team. Uh, a genuinely historic achievement. I think it's only, is it the fourth one we've won in our history? Fourth Grand Slam? Yeah, I think so, yeah. But we've never won a World Cup, which is like the thing now. Um, well, well, that would be an enormous achievement for a country of our size to win uh, a World Cup. I mean, and rugby is not a, it's not a, it's not like cricket. It's not a nine country sport. It's a, yeah. it's a serious global sport. And to be the, to be the world's best in it, or to be, at least, even to be the world number one in it is something I think we can all be proud of, whether we're rugby yeah. fans or not. And I speak as somebody who never really watches a game outside of the Six Nations or the World Cup. Um, well, uh, anyway, um, Barbie Kardashian, what did you make of that? I mean the the prison or the question. I thought the question was absolutely fantastic. Fair play to Ben. It was brilliant. It was, you know, the, the like it shouldn't be the bravest thing I've seen in a while, but like it is. To and they were caught on the hop, squirming. You know, Leo saying that he hadn't heard about the case nonsense. I mean, the name Barbie Kardashian is so distinctive. I just find it difficult to believe that that wasn't on the radar of a lot of people for a long time. And um, but he also, well, whether inadvertently or not, seemed to completely change the entire government policy on the issue. So wonderful. Well, we have to take him at his word that he had never heard about this case before. Um, we have just a little small exclusive here. We have, we have of course, submitted freedom of information requests to the Taoiseach's department asking for all records um, of correspondence mentioning Barbie Kardashian to him over the last couple of years. I suspect there'll be some there. But I mean, if, and I mean, heaven forfend, I mean, we would never accuse the Taoiseach of fibbing. But if he had been fibbing, 
and saying that he, you know, he only heard about the case this weekend. It's not as if he's going to pay a penalty for it anyway. No one's going to rake him over the coals for it in the rest of the media. I thought you, you mentioned Ben's question being brave. Uh, I was astonished that no one else in the media. Well, no, I wasn't. I should be yeah. astonished that no one else in the media followed up when Ben asked that question, but they didn't. Um, they did pick up on the story, but only I think after they saw the reaction that our coverage got online. Two point two million views for that tweet, almost a million views on the video itself. Um, I, I the reaction was just absolutely enormous and international. Um, and you were saying before we went on air that if you were working in the Taoiseach's office or or or, or indeed the leader of Fianna Fáil's office and we're looking at that reaction, you'd think we might have gotten this one wrong. I think if you look at the comments underneath, they're just overwhelmingly positive towards... Well, there's two issues there. There is a a clear... A clear annoyance or exasperation with the media at not asking the hard questions ever. And that goes, that's not just on this issue, Mm -hmm. but on a number of issues. So you can clearly see in the comments that people are really screaming out for the government to be called to account on a number of issues that they're not. And secondly, that this particular issue has taken a turn where people are frustrated at being called bigots or whatever if they ask any hard question about it, frustrated about proposals about schools and children and being ignored, frustrated about proposals or the talk about women's spaces, women's sports, etc., etc. And this question just seemed to crystallise all of those things. A a biological male in a women's prison who is a violent sex offender or made made threats to commit violent sexual offences against a woman. And people are just fed up with being kind of gaslit on this issue. And this was the moment. And I think this is a big moment. And if I was working for somebody in the government, uh, in the Taoiseach's office or in, in a press office, I'd be saying, guys, we really need to revise our view on this or what we're saying about this. Because if you st- if you scan through all the comments underneath this video and you read the things, you can see that people are not happy on this issue. They're not happy with the, le- the leadership that's being shown or lack thereof. They're not happy with being gaslit when they ask questions. And something that was a fringe issue for a lot of people is now becoming a big issue for a lot of people and they should really take stock. I think there's a couple of things. I mean, I'm trying to assess why that video, I mean, Ben has, Ben is great. I mean, I, I, I love working with Ben. He's one of those people who he he is absolutely, he's very, uh, and you know, Ben, if you're listening, I'm sorry for saying this about you, but you're very young. He's very young guy. He's only in his, his, his relatively early twenties. Um, yeah. He's finding his feet. He's not. Uh, he, he was not trained as a journalist. Journalist. He didn't go to the madrasa in DCU to learn about um, how to do it properly and all the rest of it. Uh, he just goes along and asks his questions. He's very polite. He's very respectful. But he asks questions and he, he wants to get an answer. And he has this for some reason. The reaction he seems to get from politicians, the faces they pull, the discomfort they show. Um, I think a big reason why that video got so many views wasn't so much uh, Leo's answer, which, you know, inter- well, perfectly correct, by the way. His answer was pretty good. Whether he follows up on it is another matter. But the face is being pulled by the Tishik in the background. So talked by Michal Martin in the background, the eye rolling, the shifting, the looking at feet, the sort of general sort of obvious discomfort with being asked about this. Um, I think that's what made the video go so viral. People were looking at it and saying, you know, here are these guys finally being challenged. And you, you said a minute ago that it's about them being challenged across the board. And I think that's so right. I mean, there are a lot of good journalists in Ireland, a lot of people who do really good reporting. But the Irish media have this tendency to to only get the teeth out when they're talking about uh, Donald Trump or Boris Johnson. They, they hold the mm-hmm. UK government to account much more aggressively than they ever hold the Irish government to account. I mean, the, 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 if, they, if, if the Irish gov- government were covered by the Irish media the way the UK government is covered by the Irish media, uh, I don't know we'd have a government that lasted six months, no matter who, what party was involved, because that, that coverage is so aggressive. And yet when it become, comes to the Irish um, cabinet uh, and indeed the opposition, the coverage is so softly, softly, so gentle that it's extraordinary. And I think people are sick of it um, because they do want to see these people challenged. Uh, and they do want to see, I'm uh, sorry not to be sloganeering, but they do kind of want to see cozy consensus as challenged a little bit as well. Mm-hmm. And that simply doesn't happen in the media. So it was it was massive for that reason. Now, what 
will actually happen is a good question because Varadkar committed to Ben to change the law. And then Simon Harris the next day seemed to not entirely do a U-turn, but he, he did a slight detour into mm. talking. You know, he, he, told, he toned he, he well, walked it back a little bit. We'll see. I mean, I, I think I think that he 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 talked it back a little bit, but I think ultimately they're getting the sense that there's something going on here. They're looking at what happened in Scotland and they're saying to themselves, okay, maybe this is an issue that matters more to people than we thought. And like you said, it remains to be seen. And I and I'm not really sure how like legally how they will because is it not the case that at the moment the law is that if this person identifies as a woman they are the a woman in the eyes of the law mm -hmm. so how do you how could you row back on that there do you no, know what i'm trying to say the simplest way to put it is that there's no nothing in the law that protects any aspect of womanhood so i mean literally um uh, the law as it stands, and we've said this before on the show, but it bears repeating, is that I can go into a uh, birth, deaths and marriages office tomorrow, fill out a form that's two pages long. I think I have to get it sworn or something and legally, legally be as much a woman tomorrow as you are. Have all the same rights as a woman to access female space and be treated as a woman. I can't be discriminated against. Uh, nobody, no, nobody in the country, uh, and either individually or as a collective or a corporate, can say to me, you are not a woman. So, for example, if I was to go into the dressing rooms in a store, you know, if there was gendered dressing room somewhere and I said, I want to go into the women's because I am legally a woman, it would be illegal to discriminate against me on the basis that uh, I'm obviously not biologically female. That's the law. So, so I don't know how, so you, how you square that circle because how, how can you say that we're going to treat trans women in prisons differently when legally they're not different? Legally, they're as much a woman as you are. So that's what I'm saying. What's the legal mechanism by which you would be removed from a prison? There isn't one. Mm -hmm. So yeah. because and th and that's the problem, you know, with with self ID and all of this stuff is that it it, it leads to an inevitable problem because these things arise. Yeah, and I don't know what the way out of it is. Well, at the moment, you see, the way out of it is um, the fudge that that happens is that they they come up with reason. Uh, to separate people in prison. So so if you talk to somebody on the trans rights side of this argument, they would say, oh, well, Barbie Kardashian in Limerick Women's Prison isn't actually in the general population of prisoners. He's kept in solitary confinement because he's considered a, sorry, she is considered a danger to the prison population at large. But that's a fudge. You can't do that all the time. You can't do it 95% of the time, but that's what's happening. Try and confuse the issue. But the problem with it is, of course, because I said a moment ago. Yes. By the way, John, sorry to interrupt you, but also like, I mean, we're like, th that's only a matter of time before somebody who is a transgender woman takes a case against the state for the inhumane treatment of the fact that they're in unlawfully or un unfairly, at the very least, being held in solitary confinement for a crime that's probably, let's pretend it's minor compared to everybody else. So they are being discriminated. If I'm if I'm in a woman's prison for assault and you're a transgender woman who gets brought into the prison for pickpocketing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and you're kept, <clears throat> now maybe you have some sexual uh, assault cases in your past, but your actual crime that you're there for is something relatively minor. You very, like you could very clearly make a case that you're being unlawfully discriminated against um, because the fact that you're transgender by being kept away from the main body of the prison and that you're lonely and sad and kept on your own all the time, that's not fair. Yeah. and the, like the, That's, the, that's the, inevitable. Yeah. And the, the other issue, though, which people might not have thought about, is that, as I said, you already have all the rights of a woman. Now, as you know, Sarah, women have specific rights in Irish law when it comes to, for example, being searched. So yeah. if you are, if there is a case of an intimate search, which is, is unfortunately a very common thing that has to happen in prisons because the drug problems in yeah. them and, and so on and so forth. Um, intimate searches, if you're a woman, have to legally be hired out by a woman. So the prison staff, female prison staff, uh, have to conduct, by law, intimate searches on somebody who is not biologically female. We don't need to spell it out any more than that. People know exactly what I'm saying. 
that has to happen. So it's not just the female prisoners who are at risk. It is uh, female staff in that prison who are being put in that position, which I'm sure they would rather not be in. The last point I'd make on this is that in California, this is what's really interesting with this whole debate. In California, uh, I don't know if you know this, Sarah, there are 387 cases of biological males who either have been transferred or who have applied to be transferred from a male prison to a women's prison on the basis that they have changed their gender. Um, 80% of those, those biological males, when I say they're women, have sex convictions. I don't think that's a that's a coincidence, number one. But number two, the other reason I don't think it's a coincidence is, do you know how many women, biological females, have changed their gender and applied to you move to a men's prison? <laughs> None. Uh, none? Yeah. None. none. Yeah. Which Shocker. Is, it's, 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 uh, so, I mean, there seems to be this, the, the, one of the problems is the trans rights side of this debate seems to have this notion that, oh, nobody would ever game the system. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that people game the, game the system. And the last point on Barbie Kardashian is that, of course, one of the defenses, you know, advanced by some people of Barbie Kardashian is that, Various psychological assessments that have been made public say this is somebody who does shocking things and says shocking things and likes to shock and likes to provoke and likes to be outrageous, which makes me ask the basic question, wouldn't somebody like that be a prime candidate to change their gender to shock rather than because it's genuine? I think I think that they might be. And I think the law takes no account of that. But also, I mean, they're, they're not... Um like that might all be true but it doesn't mean that it's not also true that this is a person capable of actually carrying out violent acts do you know mm-hmm. what i'm saying like the like the mental health aspect of it fine but you know tell me a person who'd like their sister who's you know in prison because she um didn't pay parking or speeding fines to share a cell with that person I, do you know what i mean like no no one. If, if so if, like, I mean, look, I hear you sighing. If you take a step back, folks, I mean, Sarah and I are both, um, actually, no, I shouldn't say Sarah and I are both, because that's very rude, but I am almost four decades on this planet. Um, <laughs> We've and, already said on the podcast before that I'm actually older than you, by yeah, okay. a small amount. By a small amount. Okay, fair enough. Well, I didn't want Mon- to say, it's still rude. Okay, it's months, not years, <laughs> but yeah. All right, fair enough. What a time to be alive. I mean, we're, ha- we're sitting here having a discussion with <laughs> two relatively educated people about, the, about, about whether or not it is just to accommodate people with penises who say that they're women in women's prisons. I mean, if you went, I imagine going back 25 years and, and, and going around the country with a microphone saying, what do you think of this, lads? I mean, it, it's, it's insane. And, and the fact that the government and the political establishment have allowed to get to this point they deserve everything that's coming their way on this topic. Um, and I think what happened to Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland uh, will happen to more than Nicola Sturgeon if this isn't changed and changed. Exactly, today. because there's a chronic lack of bravery and thinking. And they just don't want to grab the nettle on things that are scary. And because they are consistently live in a bubble with, of NGOs who we pay for to fill their head full of garbage about what is, you know, a hot topic and what matters and what's a huge issue at the, you know, like I saw a thing, some actress in America, um, like Gabrielle Union. I can't believe I re- just remembered her name. She was speaking at some awards and she stood up to uh, uh, accept her award. And she was like, trans people are being chased and murdered every day in this country. Well, Actually, if you uh, just like look into the data, they're simply untrue. So like they, the government allow like people to fill their head full of garbage about how big certain issues are and that this is a huge problem, whatever. And then they don't listen to the public at large who are getting annoyed about it or who have real concerns. They allow them to be gaslit. And now this is what happens. And the media so right, they can the- fix their own mess. And, and the last point on this is, of course, they're, they think the media are their friends, but the media are actually their enemy on this, because when it takes Ben, um, who's effectively, as I said, an amateur, he's becoming a professional, but an amateur journalist, effectively, go and ask this question. And everyone else in that press conference, the great and the good of the Irish media, bear in mind, this is the Taoiseach and the Taoiseach, this wasn't the B team that was sent to ask them questions. This was the great yeah. and the good, sat there, yeah. stum, 
uh, afraid of having the Taoiseach roll his eyes at them if they followed up on yeah. it. And they are yeah. doing the government no service with that. And they're doing themselves yeah. no service. Um, and but I John, it's telling <coughs> the, the reaction that, that they but John, it was a different subject, but it was it's the same principle that not so long ago, and it was the first time I ever remembered in my lifetime that one of those protests about immigrants and Im- those the immigration in town, they protested the Irish Times office. Mm-hmm. Like it shows that there's been a seismic shift in people's attitude towards the media. I think it happened over COVID. They felt lied to. They felt patronized. Something has shifted, and people from all walks of life, they don't trust the media, they don't believe the media, they don't think the media are asking the hard questions. As you said, there are some good journalists and there are exceptions, of course, but the the media at large didn't question the consensus during COVID. They were basically the spokespiece of people for COVID. They're the spokespeople for all the, you know, hip woke issue of the day. And they never challenge. They don't ask hard questions and people are getting fed up with it. And that's why certain media outlets online, new media outlets like Ripped and other things and other journalists and podcasts are getting more and more popular because people are fed up being told what to think by people who aren't doing anything. Even, 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 even our opposite numbers, and I use that opposite in almost every way at the ditch the impact they've had yeah uh, exactly you know with what they've been doing and i'm not i'm not always the biggest fan of what the ditch does but like the impact they've had i mean a ve- again a very small team digging up facts and scandals that it, you know the professionals the big guys in the irish times and rte uh, would never have occurred to them even to look anyway um we should probably move on to to other topics because we're, we're running short on time i want to talk a little bit um because people are complaining about this podcast that we don't disagree enough um <laughs> Uh, and they're probably right. Sarah and I are good friends. We agree on a lot. Um, but she's got one fault for her sins, which is that she's a lawyer. Um, <laughs> and therefore, as a servant of the Irish legal system, so I want to say this to you. This week, we had a case in front of Judge Martin Nolan um, where a person who was convicted of essentially costing somebody their eye in a vicious assault was sentenced to four and a half years in prison. And it just strikes me, I've written about this so many times, um, and it's another issue like the trans thing, like the immigration thing, where I think there's a growing disconnect between the public and the the system, which is that sentencing in this country seems to me to be a joke. Um, I, I look at the US where where somebody for a, a relatively small assault last, last week got 15 years in Missouri for essentially punching somebody on the street. In Ireland, you, you wouldn't see the inside of a courtroom probably for punching somebody on the street, let alone go to prison. Um, so, I mean, it, it, somebody who, who is in the legal system and knows how it works, I mean, what's your view on sentencing? I, well, I'll start by saying to to a large extent, I agree with you that like the sentencing could be, could be harder overall. And there's lots of cases, specifically Martin Nolan, where he has been, I think, very, very easy on people with convictions, with with sentencing. But on this particular day, like I w- was following this case, I was listening to it yesterday. He, um, They summed up yesterday and then he went off to think overnight about the sentencing. And when he left, when they were s- summing up, she gave her victim impact statement. And then he summed up and said his barrister said, the defendant's barrister said, you know, that he had apologised, that he'd um, turned his life around, that he regretted it massively, that he... Um, you know, was very remorseful, etc. And Martin Nolan said something, something like, I'm not quoting him directly, but he said something like, you know, I accept that he um is remorseful, that he didn't have any previous convictions, that he didn't intend to cause such harm, etc. etc. And he said, but as he was ending, he said, but there's a whole other side to this. And so I thought to myself, I'd be really interested to see what the sentence is here, because if I was if I was going home overnight to wait out my sentence and the, and the judge had said some conciliatory things about me, but then said, but there's a whole other side to this, I'd be pretty, pretty worried. Um, I think that for Martin Nolan, given his record, four and a half years was a lot. This is a 19 year old. Um, and a lot of the time, Martin Nolan can be pretty easy on, on sentencing. So I was, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm pleasantly surprised. I think they deserve more. But I thought that there was a good chance they might that this guy might get two years, I'm and always, he got four and a half. I'm and always. assault causing harm, like assault causing harm, which is what this is, is um, 
in, uh, convict, conviction on indictment to a fine or imprisonment for a term not exceeding five years. So it, within the parameters of that sentence, it's... it's oh, You almost it's got a, the maximum, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think so. That's my reading of it. But why um, does the law say it's a maximum of five years for assault causing harm? I mean, I what's what's that about? I mean, if 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 you cost well, somebody their eye, I mean that that affects them for the rest of their life. I mean, she she won't be able to drive ever because you need two eyes for that. Um, uh, there are lots of career options that she can't take. She's been physically disfigured, which um, that's it's it's a horrible thing to happen to a young person. Um. Just explain to strangers the rest of the li- rest of her life why she has one eye. Um, it's yeah, no, life, she may it's, need a, she may need a prosthetic eye ultimately. Yeah, as far as I understand, it's a life changing thing that was done to this person. Um, and four and a half years in prison, while no holiday, is not a life changing sentence. You say he's nineteen; that's a long time, but he'll be out at twenty three and a half with his whole yeah. life ahead of him and his debt to society paid. I think in terms of justice, when you, when you ask what is, 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 is justice, I mean, there are two elements to it. There's the, the punishment side of it, and there, there's the sort of, um, what's the word, um, the rehabilitation side. Um, I don't know if the Irish prisons rehabilitate people at all, so maybe it's a good, maybe that's the argument for not putting people in them. Um, but I, I don't think that that's a, a sufficient punishment for that. I, I, you know, I, I would think 10 years at a minimum, uh, and I think that's what the law should say. Uh, so maybe it's not Martin Nolan. Maybe it's the law. But then again, well, uh, this is the guy. I would say on Martin Nolan, this is the guy. The case that always stuck with me, with 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 from him, was the case. I think it was back in twenty seventeen. Where garlic. There was a, 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 no, no, yeah, there was well that, but that was on the harsh side. Six years for oh, yeah. and garlic. On the lenient side, there was a man who invited a fifteen year old girl into his van, and um, pulled out his penis, started fiddling with it, um, and made her watch. Um, this is somebody who basically abducted a child for that purpose and got a suspe- suspended sentence um, on the basis that it was on the lower end of the scale. Um, and, and for me, I, I that's, that kind of crime, if that's the sentence you're handing out, I, with all respect to the judge, I think he should find another line of work. And I think there's been a, a series of, of, of issues like that with him where I think he should find another line of work. And I think if he doesn't want to find another line of work, I've written this, the Oireachtas, which has the power to find judges another line of work, should intervene and do something about it. Because I think his sentencing over a long number of years, whatever about this case, has been um, out of step, shall we say, with the public mood. Yeah, I mean, no, I, I, I do agree on that. That's kind of my point, is that I don't... Now, by the way, the criminal law isn't exactly my area, but there's a difference between assault causing harm and cause an assault causing serious harm. An assault causing serious harm can carry i think imprisonment up to for life or or up to life so i suppose here the distinction wasn't made that it was serious and i'm not sure how that is but anyway i think four and a half years i I, i'm i'm talking about four and a half years being a reasonable custodial sentence within the realms of the fact that this is martin nolan and i believe he gave less than two years as i recall to somebody who'd poured boiling water over a toddler um so, you know, he's definitely a, a light on sentencing in in his time. And there's a number of, you know, there's been petitions and lo- there's a lot of public outcry about some of his sentencing. All right. But, but, no, but what, here, here's a question. No political outcry. Why Why is that? No. I mean, it, it, it's astonishing to me. I mean, this is an issue where, like, if I was advised, if I was in the business of advising politicians, which I am no longer because I got sense, but if I was in the business of advi- and they don't listen. But if you have as the business advising <laughs> politicians, I would say um, this is an issue where you can differentiate yourself and take us take a position which I would suspect is popular with 60, 70, 80 percent of the public, which is that sentencing for criminal uh, crim- for crimes in Ireland is far too lenient. Um, I don't know why nobody in the main the, across the political spectrum from Fianna Fáil to people for profit, there is nobody taking that line. Um, I'm old enough to remember the 1997 general election where Fianna Fáil won in large part, you might recall, because of John O'Donoghue in, uh, saying he would campaign on a zero tolerance policy for crime uh, based on Rudy Giuliani's old broken windows theory in New York. And basically everyone was going to go to jail. They were going to get real tough on crime. That was a big reason that Fianna Fáil won that election all the way back in 1997. It's inconceivable that any political party would even think of doing that now. And I'm fascinated as to what the reason for that is, because it's an issue crying out for 
political leadership and no one wants to provide it. But there's also, I mean, huge, the, a huge public anger. I mean, certainly Dublin city centre has become a complete kind of parts of it anyway. Complete no-go areas, if you ask me, um, at certain times of the day. Um, certainly it got worse over COVID. And then there is an up to, up, an increase in crime. But, I mean, I'll give you an example. Just this week, um, our next-door neighbour, uh, uh, her daughter plays with us, and, and I was dropping her daughter back because it was St. Patrick's Day and we were leaving to go over to my parents' house. And she had come back, walked in on a burglar, like 20 minutes before I came to the house, she came back with her other daughter, came into her ups the stairs in her room, came into her bedroom. There's a man in her bedroom burgling the house. You know, just like there's a lot of burglary. There's a lot of that kind of thing. There's, a, there's, there's been an increase in crime. Um, But, you know, let's all sit down and get a load of NGOs in to talk about um, hate speech law because that's really the hot topic that's affecting people's lives right now. Yeah, what I'd people say- said to hurt someone's feelings on the internet. That's more important than my neighbour, a woman coming home with her daughter um, and and walking in on a burglar, you know, come on. It it seems to me there's two elements to this here. The first is this sort of general assumption in the um, chattering class. Yeah. Media NGOs to politicians that if somebody commits a crime in Ireland, it's not that they've let us down. It's that we failed them. You know, it's that it's that we as a society have failed the criminals. It's really Mm -hmm. our fault. You know, it's it's deprivation. It's poverty. It's. It's um, social disadvantage. It's all of those things. The kids have know. nothing to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah kids yeah. have nothing to do. But actually, society has failed the criminals, not that the criminals have failed society. It's like that whole sort of idea of owing a debt to society uh, that you spend in prison has been reversed. It's now society owes a debt to you, which is why mm-hmm. you guys with three, four hundred convictions uh, and literally three, four hundred convictions getting suspended sentence. That's the first thing. Yeah. And the second thing yeah. is, it's like, Nobody wants to address one of the one of the main problems here, which is the absolute lack of prison spaces. In the last twenty years, our population has grown by twenty five percent or something, uh, and I'm not aware that we've added a single new prison cell in that time. Which is one of the reasons why judges are reluctant to send people to jail is because there's no room in the jails, um, and mm. nobody nobody wants to say I'm going to spend um, you know a hundred million quid of, of taxpayers' money building a new prison. Of course, probably because it's end up costing two billion or something. If the children, <laughs> but nobody wants to. Nobody wants to do that. They think it would be unpopular. I think it would be massively popular um, to build a new prison um, and to up sentencing and to take a hard line on this. But for some reason, again, this is an example. I, I don't think politicians talk to the public are in this. step. Yeah, yeah they, they, they take their cue from the Irish Council for Civil Liberties um, yeah. and Amnesty and um, you know uh, Una Mullally more than they yeah. do from 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 the public. Uh, and, yeah. I, I, and right across the spectrum, which is why none of the opposition parties have the basic gumption to talk about this. It's astonishing. Yeah, like, like I'd love to see a poll done of, you know, like like we were talking last week about the Late Late Show, where, you know, you got the years ago with the nighty scandal, where you got couples to go up and ask, you know, what do you think your, uh, your the couple's answer to this question would be? I'd love to get politicians and the general public and do a poll of like, what are the top 10 issues affecting people's lives? And what do politicians think they are? So I think that the top thing, things affecting people's lives in no particular order are you know, housing, health, uh, child care, crime. Um, what else, John? Immigration. Um, immigration. Um, and it, anyway, and politicians think that it's uh, hate crime, um, uh, trans rights and... Um, climate change. Uh, climate change. Um God, my, I'm drawing a blank here. But um, you get my point. My point is that, oh, oh um, all of the things that the National Women's Conference to- uh, Council talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, gender uh, quotas. Gender quotas. Um, women, uh, you know, like just kind of all these fluffy things. And if we know from this week that if you bring up um, any of the things that might be actually bothering people, you get an eye roll and shifting and whatever. And the point is that there's a complete misstep between what they think people care about and what people actually care about. Well, what we talked and, about last week, for example, was the, the, the this referendum on women on the home. 
I, I have yeah. not met. I have genuinely not met in my life a normal person. By a normal person, I mean somebody who, working in the private sector and doesn't follow politics particularly closely, but have opinions in the state of the country. Who's ever said to me, "You know what we need to do is change the constitution where it says that thing about women in the home," because that really upsets me. That is, the but classic. also, we talked about John, it last week, so we won't redo the conversation. But I mean, it's it's the classic example of what you're talking about. But it's also it's a proof of the is it of the pudding is in the eating and the, as they say because it died on the vine in the media the story they announced a, a referendum and there was a couple of op ed pieces about it and then it just flittered away in the wind because no one cares and there's no mm-hmm. meat in it and no one really like gives a damn about whether they do it or not or what's in it and they'll have to squeeze something interesting out of this referendum because ultimately it's not something that actually bothers people it goes back to the thing we talked about before people want you know to be able to pay their bills and oh energy that's another thing that's actually very but people want to pay their bills and they want to be able to go on holiday maybe once a year and be able to go and bring their family for something to eat once in a blue moon that's what they care about they don't care about someone saying something mean on the internet no they like don't. Do you know what I mean? They don't care about any of this stuff. They don't care about, you know, what this, what like new legislation to remove the word woman from the constitution, or women in the home from the constitution. But you get a grip. No one cares about that. Well, like, people care about real stuff and they're going to find out in the next election. Like they really are, because I think people have just fed up with being told what they think. But I, don't, I, 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 I wish they were going to find out in the next election. But I mean, who do you vote for? I mean, this is the thing. Who do you, who do you vote for? I mean, do you think Sinn Féin are going to take a substantially different tack? And on that, uh, that, that actually leads me into the point I was going to make, which is the last thing we were going to talk about on this show today, which is the, the fact that the, the political system did spend most of the week debating something, which a topic which I think is, is, is important to people, which is housing. But a specific mm. policy, which I don't think has anywhere near the political public or political traction that it's been assigned by the media and the uh, opposition, which is this eviction ban. Um, I mean, to me, this idea that I keep here, I was listening to Owen O'Brien the other day on Kieran Cuddity's show on News Talk, going on about how there is going to be an absolute wave of homelessness in the next few weeks on foot of the eviction ban not being extended. The eviction ban is five months old. If there is a wave of homelessness because a five-month-old eviction ban is suddenly lifted, then I would put it to you that the problems in the housing system are much more widespread than whether the government does or does not ban landlords from deciding who lives in their own property. It's 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 it's, ast- it's astonishingly short sighted in the first instance. And number two, I mean, there seems to be no actual disagreement that the eviction ban is is bad policy. It's just that it's an emergency measure, and therefore we should um, keep it going until the emergency is over, which is a, is a ridiculous argument uh, because it's a, it's an emergency measure that, in my view, makes things worse. But what's your take on it? I think my take on it is is that you know you have to make a decision, and 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 there's lots of things the government do that I don't agree with, but on this, I agree. I mean, you have to make a decision about whether you're gonna whether you're. Put, Polit- politi- politicizing for today or for the future and like if you only care about today well then eviction bans make sense but the problem is that like you can't be only a government of renters you have to also be a government of landlords or landlords leave do you know what I mean like it's not just the vulture funds and big huge landlords and huge it's there's also smaller landlords and if you you know, if you demonize them so much and not, not let them get rid of people for e- ever and do all these tinkering around the edges, you know, rent controls and all these things, you you make people leave in droves, like the the the, uh, the landlords. And people don't want to talk about that, but it's true. And down the line, you know, like the, the, evic- the eviction ban can't just last forever. So you're just kicking things down the line and kicking things down the line. It was only supposed to be a temporary measure. And I think a lot of the opposition guys, you know, Holly Kearns and all are playing emotional, you know, politics with this when they're be- I, I, I think they're being very disingenuous. It, and I also don't really understand how the likes of Ono Brin do the sums that it automatically follows that all of the people who are evicted become homeless. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like that's not that's not a, that's not that's being disingenuous. 
as usual. What? Like you can't say that if people who are about to be evicted, let's just say because um, their landlords are selling up or whatever the case may be, that they it follows that they become homeless. It doesn't. But, you know, like the, the I just think there's a lot of populism. There's a lot of emotive speeches and breathy outcry and oh, like, you know, whatever. And ultimately, this eviction ban could never last forever. You can't put it this way, John. I'm not in a position to be buying any second properties. I don't know if you are. But if you had some money to invest, I think that you would look at the market, look at all of this and go, well, the last thing I'm going to do is buy an apartment to rent. No, I'd put it in agricultural land. Well, there you go. I, I, that's I, a, if I, if that's I was... a problem, though. That's a problem. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's a problem because what it means is that the climate, the the, the environment just doesn't look good for renters or for, for, for landlords and not but, all landlords. Like, I know two people, for example, and... Uh, they they live near they live near to me and uh, I'd be friendly enough with them and neither of them have pensions but they're elderly like they're in their eighties they don't have pensions but they own two apartments that they rent out and last year they sold one of them because they were frightened because they're old they were frightened about what was happening what was going to happen um you know restrictions that might be brought in they pay tax on everything you know like we like. They just decided to just sell one of the apartments ultimately. And there's one house, one apartment off the rental stock. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And uh, I, I just think, I think the government ultimately made the right call and they were put under tremendous pressure. And as I said, all of the emotive, teary, breathy speeches. But ultimately, I think that this was the right call. I wish they'd make other right calls though. Because you yeah. talk about, I mean, th this is an area, I mean, this is the b bizarre thing about housing, is that it's an area where the government gets awful stick, even though all the policy has been made by the opposition. Mm -hmm. Because the government have adopted almost every call, every opposition idea on housing, from, from rent controls to um, limits on mortgages, to all those sorts of things. And so you have a property market in Ireland where, for example, the first thing that happens is, in terms of buying property, German pension funds can outbid Irish buyers because of the central bank's restrictions on how much you can borrow. So Irish people are disadvantaged in their own country in terms of buying houses because of government policy and government legislation and central bank rules. Second thing that happens is nobody's incentivized to build houses in half the country because it, you, nobody's going to build properties in rent pressure zones where the margin you can make on those properties is actually limited by law. So you're disincentivizing investment. Um, landlords, you'd be insane to stay a landlord and you'd be even more insane, as you just said, to get into being a landlord. And finally, there's this idea, which is just fantasy economics that is constantly advocated for. I, I'm sick of hearing politicians saying the government should build more houses. I mean, it, it's not a matter of just spending the money. They're bidding against themselves. I mean, we're oh. spending four billion or something insane. Uh, and it, you know, people have strong views on this, so I'm not going to say whether it's right or wrong. But we're spending about four billion to rebuild houses in Donegal, which means we're employing plumbers and carpenters and bricklayers and all the rest of it to, to rebuild mica homes. We are spending another three or four billion um, insulating rich people's houses for them. Um, so again, we have plumbers and carpenters and 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 electricians going to insulate people's houses because Eamon Ryan thinks it'll help climate change. Um, and now the government, now these people say the government should spend billions to build more houses. So all that's happening is the government is bidding against itself three times for the services of plumbers and carpenters and electricians and bricklayers. And it's also bidding against the private sector. So it's just driving inflation in, house, in housing across the board by doing too much, let alone not mm -hmm. doing enough. Um, and at the same time, you or I um, have a leak in our bathroom and want to get a plumber. We can't get one for seven or eight months because those guys are all employed and it, it's the best it's the best trade to be in um, mm -hmm. is building. And at the same time as that, the last point is our education policy is telling everyone to go to universities and get sociology degrees. When in actual fact, what we need is more people to become bricklayers and carpenters and plumbers and electricians. Well, oh. sociology, I mean, I take sociology. Half of people now, as far as I can make out, are getting degrees in kind of like inter feminism via interpretive dance and the Hegelian dialect or something <laughs> such crapola. But, uh, but uh, that's a whole other show, as they say. Yeah, I saw, I, I, you know what, I actually heard something speaking of Donegal during the week, or was it last week on the radio, where they had some expert on talking about how they found some other, um, some other chemical within the bricks. And it was so horrifying, because he was saying that this needed to be addressed separately or something that I had to turn it off. 
I mean, I think that we there's a, an entire conversation to be had there about insurance and uh, you know a fund for this kind of stuff. But that's a that's a whole other thing. Well, but Neve, ultimately, sorry, Neve, Neve, who I, I work with um, and writes for for Gript, is always asking, you know, why aren't the insurance companies and the the building companies on the hook for yeah. some of the costs of Mike? I think the answer is the costs are just too big. That if they contributed their entire business, um, if they were told to sell everything, it wouldn't cover one percent of the cost, let alone one hundred percent of the cost. I think that's the reason. Uh, and you'd also be putting a construction company out of business at a time when we need more houses. So there's there there there, there are all sorts. Of, it's just it's just an absolute mess. Um, but again, it's one of those messes in Ireland that, as far as I'm aware, no one's actually been held to account for. Nobody. No, of course not. Um, but yeah, I mean. It... Look, there's loads, there's loads of issues. There's loads of things that make up the housing crisis. There's problems, um, historical problems that we're still dealing with. There's problems that we're making today and there's problems that we're kicking into the future. But the but the eviction ban and ending the eviction ban is not one of those problems. And we see like that, as you said yourself, they're implementing opposition policy because they're put under so much pressure by the opposition about different things. And I, I, I think fair play to them that they stood the ground and, and the, you know, they can't just continue to um, have an eviction ban. It's as simple as that. And um, I think it was the right call for once. I said on Twitter this week uh, that I really want to see Owen O'Brien as Minister for Housing. Because I, 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 I'm honestly of the view that you just have to, I mean, the, the public have been fed such a diet of this stuff that they, it, it, I mean, you and I are all right, Jack. We both have homes, thankfully, that we live in. Um, mm-hmm. But there's an awful lot of young people out there who seem to think that this can all be fixed by the magic wands of the government. Um, that if the government just put its mind to it and really cared, there'd be houses for everyone tomorrow. But then Jason O'Mahony, yeah. our friend uh, and sometime contributor to this podcast, was making the point that actually, no, John, you're wrong, because if Owen O'Brien is Minister for Housing, he'll spend four years saying, uh, well, I'm fixing the legacy of Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael and everyone will give him a break. That's just the way politics works. Um, but but I, I think the this problem is is not going to be fixable the way the political establishment is trying to fix it. I mean, And I don't think it really works out that way because it didn't really work out that way for Labour. Like, I'm old enough to remember, as they say, when, you know, p- people were... Um, totally caught up with the Gilmore Gale and Fianna Fáil were, um, you know, ruined the country and all that narrative and um, Labour were going to fix everything and they were wonderful. And people cottoned on pretty fast that uh, that wasn't going to be, like, that wasn't going to be the way it was going to play out. And a lot of people, especially in the inner city where I used to be a councillor, um, got really, really annoyed with Labour really, really fast. Um, yeah. and felt very let down by them really quick and they didn't get a break they didn't get you know a long honeymoon period and I don't think um, I don't think Sinn Féin would get enough um, of a honeymoon period for them to actually um, or for, I, I don't think they'd get a honeymoon period of any description but I also my thing with Sinn Féin is that there's a lot of if the election plays out the way we think in that Sinn Féin get a lot of TDs and they get a lot of additional TDs to what they have now, I'm, you know, I think that um, being a TD in a, in a, in a government where you're making hard decisions requires a certain amount of metal. And um, I think that a lot of their TDs will find that incredibly difficult because they are, you know, completely, um, um, involved in their communities and they'll get that feedback really fast yeah they've and never they've never been on the wrong side of and, and i use this term i don't mean as an insult but they've never been on the wrong side of the mob yeah ever. exactly um, and i and think the that they would find that tough them. they would and what's interesting uh, is you mentioned the labor party uh going to government in 2011 is the way irish politicians never seem to learn their lessons um the the, the mistake the labor party made in that election was wildly over promising you know, yeah. it, we were in the middle of a massive economic depression and they were promising um, all sorts of goodies and trinkets and nice things and an end to austerity that was never going to be deliverable that they didn't have to do to do very well in that election. And they got yeah. killed for it. And Sinn Féin's promises on housing are so impossible to keep that I'm astonished that they're making them. Um, it's, a, it, it, it's, a, it's basic. I suppose politics 101 is win, win the election, worry later. But 
it's it's a very quick way to earn yourself a backlash when you're making promises that can't be kept, that are being believed by people who are desperate. That's and um, I'm also not convinced that Shiv, like I think Sinn Fein have gone apart from housing, they've gone very quiet. Um, they're very quiet on a lot of the, you know, the we'll call them the Barbie Kardashian type issues. They stay out of the fray on a lot of the that kind of stuff. And I think that you know and I know that general elections are funny. Like you and I could be talking about all those, you know, issues that I was saying earlier on that matter to people will say energy and housing and health and all of that. But an election could be called six months from now that ends up circling around a particular issue that you or I haven't even imagined yet. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? It could be about crime. It could be about um something specific, you know, so the, the terms of an election can dictate things uh, and it might end up being an issue that Sinn Féin don't have particularly a particularly strong position on. We just don't know. I think that the the election, I don't think um, Sinn Féin or Fianna Gael or Fianna Fáil are going to do particularly well out of it. But I don't think it's written in the written in stone just yet that Sinn Féin are going to romp home, as they say. Well, I wrote a piece on this this week, which I'll, I'll leave as our last point because we're almost out of time, which is that the astonishing thing about Irish politics is how stable it is. All these issues Barbie Kardashian, immigration, health, COVID, housing, all of these issues where the government have um, taken a beating um, or should be taking a beating, you think, according to the laws of politics. The polls are relatively stable. Yes, every every week there's a new opinion poll and Fianna Fáil are up four or down four or Fine Gael are up four or down four. But the broad balance of power between Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael on one side and Sinn Féin on the other has been basically stable since the election. The movements yeah. have been very small. There has been no massive breakthrough. Now, the, the one thing that, that's a factor for people to think about is that Sinn Féin will do better at the next election, even if they get the same amount of votes they did the last time, because they'll have the sense to run more candidates and thus get more, more TDs elected. So, so, so it is likely that they will gain seats, even if they don't gain votes. But um, it has to be said uh, that there's been... The, our, the public are not yet clear on the kind of change they want. Um, which is a big advantage that the government still has, despite all of it. Mm. Anyway, we we'll leave it there, folks. Um, thank you very much, as ever, for tuning in. We didn't fight as much as we, we promised we would this week, Sarah. We're really going to have to fix that. Uh, it might help that next week we're hoping to be joined by Carl Dieter to maybe do an even more in-depth dive on housing and sort of the housing issue in general. Uh, and also just to have the chats, because Carl is a very intelligent and insightful fellow. But until then, uh, thanks so much for listening. And that was the week that really was.